Uh, welcome to Open uh, Lens at Westminster, our series of reboot events at the start of the session. Uh, we're looking at some of the issues that are likely to dominate the next 12 months. And uh, with a variety of speakers, we're looking at the dilemmas and underlying currents in British politics. Our next contribution is from uh, John Denham, who's a former member of Parliament, but also a former Cabinet Minister, uh, Secretary of State for Innovation, Universities and Skills, and also for Communities and Local Government. But most recently, and his contribution to the Spirit of Britain book, is around uh, English identity, and he's currently working uh, avidly through the English Labour Network, which is uh, his main preoccupation. So, John, we very much look forward to your contribution. Neil, thank you very much. Um, I was asked to write a chapter for Stephen Kinnock's collection of essays uh, called The Spirit of Britain. And in my contribution, I wanted to address a fairly fundamental question. What is Britain? Uh, we're here in central London, not far from Westminster, where people talk about British interests and British policy all of the time. But we often forget to ask, well, what is this Britain that people are talking about? Because every institution can outlive its usefulness. And the Britain, as we understand it, was created for a very particular purpose that no longer actually exists. And my argument is that if we want to talk about Britain for the future, we need to answer the question, what is Britain going to be for in the 21st century? It's about 50-odd years now since the US Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, said Britain has lost an empire and is yet to find a role. I think he was actually be quite surprised to find 50 odd years later that actually that observation is still behind much of the turmoil that's facing British politics, particularly after the referendum. And of course the real issue here is that Britain as we know it was forged out of and for the purposes of empire. I mean empire, the elements of it had begun to exist before the Act of Union and the Act of Union wasn't just about empire but the Britain we know, the institutions that were created, the idea of Britishness was all about creating a state that could, not, that could manage not the islands of Britain but the greatest, largest empire that anybody had ever seen. But that empire doesn't exist anymore, apart from a few tax havens and gambling dens and places of cesspits of sort of corrupt criminality, the empire has gone. So if the womb that gave rise to Britain and the idea of Britishness no longer exists, what is the purpose of Britain today? Because we can't simply assume that it will go on and we can't assume that it should go on. We've come close to it breaking up over Scotland. The delicate balance of the Northern Ireland settlement is in question because of Brexit. There is deep discontent in England. And my argument is that we need to think again about what Britain is for, and we need to learn some lessons, not least from the Brexit referendum result. Because when, as the Leavers would say, we went into the common market, this was not about a new vision of Britain's future in the world post-empire. It was very explicitly technocratic. We will be better off. It was driven by an elite across business and politics who believed in British declinism, that we couldn't manage on our own. We couldn't make our way in the world. And that is partly the root of the current problem. Because that deal 40 years ago was on the basis of you can measure the success of this by whether it works for you. And we are where we are today because for large numbers of people, it didn't work for them. Uh, and the EU became associated with all the sins of global change, challenges to cultural value, values, local economic decline, and so on. And even uh, two years ago, the Remain campaign was still framed in the language of the declinist agenda. Not a positive reason for Europe, but simply it'll be worse if we don't. And there's a warning from that history, which is if we try to defend the union itself on the basis of, well, it'll be worse if we don't, that won't work. And we saw that actually in the Scottish referendum. As an MP, we were told in Westminster the polling was absolutely clear that the only thing the Scots cared about was whether they'd be £300 a year better off or worse off as a result of independence. And yet when the referendum campaign actually got going, we found a nation debating its own future in a way far beyond the sort of mechanistic way we've been told to expect. 
So I think if we want to have a Britain that works for the future, it has to be something that's much more persuasive, much more powerful, uh, a much clearer vision of a post-imperial Britain. Uh, others will talk about how Britain faces outwards. I want to talk about how we look at things inwardly. Now, actually, if you stand back, you can see that the process of developing a post-imperial notion of Britain has been underway for some time, but it's just incomplete and uneven. You could argue, after the debates of the 19th century about Ireland, the, the, the process of post-imperial Britain began with the partition of Ireland in the early 1920s. After the Second World War, clearly the imperial state asserted itself for a time, but ultimately Wales and Scotland, and Scotland in particular, wanted a different deal. And we're currently in a situation where we're torn between some nations which have elements of devolution and an adherence here in London to the old imperial unitary state, the idea that everything is best run from London. Because Britain created institutions to manage empire, but also delivered at home parliamentary democracy, a sense of the rule of law, strong government institutions, the idea perhaps of public service. And when Attlee came, these weren't originally for working class people, but when Attlee came to power after the Second World War, he inherited an imperial state that had just fought successfully a Second World War. And that was a tool for Labour government to rebuild Britain after the war. But that has become, as we saw in Scotland and Wales, increasingly less attractive, the idea that you run everything from London. And more recently, there's been a catastrophic collapse in public confidence in those institutions, in Parliament, in, in the BBC, in the state itself, in the way the legal system operates. And actually, that has become particularly marked, not just in Scotland and Wales, but in England as well. It is England that is taking the UK out of the European Union. It is England outside in London in particular that provided the vast bulk of the votes to take us out of the EU. It was in England that the appeal, appeal to take back control was at its strongest. Now, if you want to know how you explain that, well, in part, of course, it's clear that the perception was the EU hadn't worked for large parts of England. Whether that's right or not is perhaps a, a subject for another debate. It might well have been worse if we'd not been in the EU, EU, but nonetheless, in the absence of any attempt to make the case for the EU, the European Union was associated with all that people thought was wrong. But there's more to it, because decline didn't just happen in England. It happened in other parts of the United Kingdom as well. And what is striking is that other parts of the United Kingdom have had opportunities to rethink their post-imperial identity. Scotland, in particular, has both had its referendum and, indeed, its take-back control moment when it got rid of the Labour Party, to a large extent, in Parliament in Westminster. Uh, Wales actually did vote leave, was not an enthusiastic devolutionary nation to start with, but has created a distinct Welsh political space. Northern Ireland, for different reasons, because of its tragic history, has had to find an accommodation, a, a settled ambiguity, if you like, about its relationship with Britain, with the EU, and with the Republic of Ireland. England is the only part of Britain, only part of the United Kingdom, that has not had a debate about its own role and its own future as a nation with the United Kingdom. It lacks any focus for that debate, because it has no parliament, to, it has no place in which English legislation is made by English MPs. England is excluded from the national debate. It is never mentioned by the UK government. The Labour Party doesn't name England when it produces policy for England. And of course, in the referendum campaign, which was run as Scotland stronger in Europe, Wales stronger in Europe, in England only was it Britain stronger in Europe, nobody even thought the English were worth talking about. And it's not a surprise that people in England were more likely to think the EU had a dominant position in the government of the country, and the English are more likely to prioritize English issues over the Union. England is the only part of the UK run by the UK government. It is the most centralized nation in Europe as well. And it's always worth saying this, and particularly sometimes to say this if you're speaking in London, 
there are more people who are English in English in England than there are who are British. So there are more people who say I'm more English than there are people who say I'm more British. More people will say I'm English rather than British if they're asked to have a choice. L most people are, say they're both strongly English and strongly British, but at the strongest end there are more people who are strongly English than strongly British. It is usually assumed around Westminster that it's the other way around, that most people are British and a few people are English. So when we assume, as we often do, that the challenge to Britain the challenge to the Union comes primarily from Scotland, and perhaps because of Brexit from Northern Ireland, we miss the fact that England's discontent is equally important. So we need to find a new basis for the Union. I think it is quite impossible to reassert the idea of the central British imperial unitary state as being the thing that really makes Britain work, below which you have a certain level of devolution. The only possibility for the Britain is the mutual coming together of nations that wish to be in a union together because it suits our purposes for the future, not because it worked for us or for empire in the past. And those areas of mutual interest are not difficult to describe. They clearly lie in trade, in foreign policy, in international relations and defence. They lie too in the weaknesses of the current devolution settlement, which has all been about some places taking power from Westminster, and very little debate about the areas where cooperation between devolved nations is essential. But we do actually live in a country where Welsh patients are treated in Birmingham hospitals where the water supply comes from Wales. We are not separate nations. And the current rows about where agricultural policy should lie illustrate very starkly the need for institutions of cooperation across Britain, not just devolution from the centre. And critical, of course, is the question of finance in Britain. For the foreseeable future, England, and particularly London and the South East, will pay for the cost of the, of the United Kingdom. That redistribution of wealth is impossible. Yet our current settlement of finance is unfair and uneven, not least to the poorest regions of England and to Wales. So a new financial settlement is necessary. So the coming together of nations, freely, in their mutual interests, with some levels of cooperation and some clear areas where things need to be decided together is where Britain's future lies. But let me end, though, by touching on a question of why, why somebody like me from the Labour Party, from the left, thinks these issues of national identity and national determination are so important. Nations don't belong to one political party, never should belong to one political party. But I think at this particular moment in time, it is only the left that has the capability of addressing the sort of questions I've been talking about. That is partly because the right is still trapped in old ideas of an imperial Britain, and partly because much of the liberal centre disdains national identity and patriotism entirely and wishes it to have no part in policy. And I think there are two things that only the left is able to deal with in our politics. The first is the legacy, the language of the legacy of imperialism, because it is a contested history. Uh, there is good and there is bad. There's success, there's achievement, there's cruelty, there's exploitation in that history. Only the left, I think, can successfully articulate that the thing that matters about Britain now is that empire actually equips us to be successful in the modern world. It is the very diversity of this country and our links with people all around the world, which would only have happened because of empire, that actually makes it possible for us to be successful in the world as it is today. And I think only the left is able to articulate a way of dealing with our imperial legacy which gives us a positive view of the future. And the second reason is fundamental to the nature of the left itself. Democratic socialism, social democracy, call it what you will, depends on the idea that there is a majority within a society in whose interest the country should be run. That the aim of policy is to serve the common good. 
And historically, for the left, it was clear who that majority was and where they came from. It was the industrialized, unionized working class. But that largely no longer exists, either as a social entity or as an economic entity, because the way in which our economies have changed. What we're seeing right across the Western world, particularly in Europe, is new identities becoming important to people as those old identities weaken. And in particular, the identities of nation, people, and place are becoming stronger. They're becoming stronger whether we want them to or not, but they're becoming stronger. And at the moment, it has largely been the right in politics across Europe that have tapped into those developments and exploited them quite dangerously. But what the left needs to understand is actually our ability to build a democratic socialist society, to appeal to the politics of the common good, requires some common sense of identity. And that is actually more likely to be based on the idea of nation, of a progressive patriotism, than on any other. So being engaged in these issues, one can do it partly because I want the union to be reformed in a way that works, partly because I want England to find its own political identity and political expression, but partly because I think if we don't engage with these issues, the possibility of creating a majority for the sort of progressive, socialist, social democratic politics that I've always believed in is going to be harder and harder to achieve. So the piece I've written for Stephen's book tries to lay out that, that these are not as you often hear in the Labour Party, constitutional issues, no one's interested in these. These are fundamental to the debates about the type of society we should be trying to create. Thank you.